I just saw that tweet you just put out, Nick, that from President Trump. Yep. Man, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening right now, right now as we talk with the border regarding it. It's crazy. Yeah, man. I mean, it's it's gotten to the point where Biden's backed into a corner. What does he do? I mean, he's, what is he going to do, send in the military? Federalize the guard? I, I think that'd be probably a bad move on his part. There's some channels on Telegram talking about, you know, the citizens t- stepping up and, and going down there. I hope it don't come to that, but it seems like it might. I mean, there's a lot of chatter right now, a lot of chatter, a lot of rumbling on that level. Why should it have to come to that, though? That's the thing I don't You know, get. that's a great question. That's a great question, Nick. And, and the issue that I take with this is what exactly are we, American taxpayers, paying our federal government to do? Because the sole role of the United States federal government is to protect our borders. I mean, it's literally the sole role. It's not to make, you know, roads. It's not for infrastructure. It's really not any of that. It's actually to protect the borders. And that's the one thing they're not doing. It's in Americans, you know, I think the Biden administration and Biden loyalists and Biden Democrats are going to find out that Americans really don't like that kind of kind of thing. Oh, yeah. No, this is the worst possible time for this to be happening for, for Biden here in 2024. And, you know, you, you are right to say that the federal government's main role is to protect the border, because if you don't have a border, you don't have a country. You just you don't. I mean, when you wouldn't allow, I know there have been some controversial statements over the past few days about this, but where people are conflating immigrants and invaders, okay? We're not being invaded by the Swedes. Yes, we do have Swedish immigrants and stuff. I know somebody mentioned that the other day on this panel, which doesn't make any sense. I don't see them, you know, jumping the border down at the southern border. These are this is a different breed of people. These are my family came from Sweden. The reason they used a boat because it was a long swim. My family came from Italy. I would concur. They may have been on a similar boat. You know, what's really interesting. My wife is Korean. I don't know if you knew that. And somebody was making a comment. I said something about like Asian cuisine or whatever. And it was like a friend and she's immediately looks at me and says, that's racist. I looked at her. I'm like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, oh, you're conditioned to think that. You're conditioned to see a race issue in everything. And I asked her, please point out to me where what I said had anything derogatory towards Koreans or Asians. And she couldn't. I said, then why did you say that? And that's the problem with people. They're not thinking through everything you're saying. There are many different races and many different religions that are coming over the border. People that are coming over the border illegally and they're not understanding it. And they want to just say it's race because. They're limited in their thinking to think that we're talking about Mexican people. Guess what? Mexican people aren't coming over the border. It's not Mexican people. It's people from Central and South America. And the other part that they're not understanding is at the beginning of the Biden administration, Kamala Harris went to Central and South America and we funded, you know, some things in Central and South America, which I believe is how it's financed. Because how these people make these long treks and they usually look pretty good with their cell phones and food. It's very expensive to walk along that distance. And buses were brought into the whole thing while in Mexico or getting through Central America. So how did they, who paid for all that? Did they just, these are poor people that decided to spend thousands of dollars worth to get to America. I mean, come on, think it through. And how come we can't get any answers to this? Why will nobody answer that question as to who's because funding want- this and, and how they're actually arriving? You know, because a lot of these people, they're coming from Guinea in Africa, which is insane. I mean, that distance is insane. Where are they flying into and who's paying for it? Because this is one of the poorest countries on the face of the planet. And I mean, to be fair, if you are saying that you are you're trying to declare asylum in the United States with no evidence at all, yet you just spent thousands and you know, tens of thousands of dollars, even in some cases, to come over and pay the cartels to transfer you up to the U.S. border and drop you off, you know, I mean, what kind of asylum are you actually seeking? And you don't have to specify that at the border. You just come in and say that you're seeking asylum. That's it. You know, it's like there were somebody asking me from Canada the other day, like, oh, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to come visit the United States, but I can't get a visa quick enough. And I was like, well, just come to the border and declare asylum and you'll be let in. You don't have no questions asked. Yeah, they won't give you a hard time going into Mexico. Just come back. They won't give you a hard time coming back. Just, yeah, asylum. 
Hey, you know, Nick, people aren't asking the right questions and it's no wonder why they're doing everything they can to shut Elon Musk down, to shut X down and get a grip on it because they want to control the message because they can control through the Smith Modernization Act of 2012. By law, they can distribute propaganda domestically, which Americans, not enough America, Americans know that. So they can control the legacy media to share the narrative they want to share. And they can stop the questions they don't want asked, like the ones you were asking. Those are brilliant questions. If more Americans knew to start asking those questions, more Americans would be calling their congressmen and senators and saying, hey, Mr. Congressman, who's funding this stuff? Where is it? I would like to see the receipts. If more Americans did that, I guess, guess what? That would put a lot of politicians on the hot plate and a lot of politicians would start thinking about reelection. And I think we'd have some politicians selling Joe Biden's administration up the river, even Democrats. Well, so speaking about you... elections, do we want to get into the Biden Trump thing? Anybody? So, oh, hey, I, uh... All right, this guy. Hey, I didn't know you drove a bus, too. <laughs> Thanks, man. Just hit me with the bus. All right, fair enough. Let's go. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> so, Mike, I've worked with Mike in the past, Mike Berlin. He's a former Clinton strategist, Senator Clinton, Mayor Bloomberg. And we've worked in the past. I've interviewed him a few times on my podcast, and he has really good perspectives on this stuff. He's a kind of a savant. And so, Nick, if that's okay, I kind of wanted to kick things off and get some questions to him and get the conversation moving on the Trump Biden thing. But, first question I had for Mike was like, obviously the space name is Trump versus Biden, but are, is Haley pretty much over? That's kind of where I want to start because everyone's kind of assuming she's over, but you don't always have the same opinion as the masses do. So I was curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, first of all, Justin, thank you for uh, allowing me, inviting me into this group. I'm fascinated by the conversation, Mario. I, I appreciate you putting this to together. There's a couple elements going on and I was just fascinated by the discussion on immigration. I'd like to go into that in a second. I had told Justin that I thought if Nikki Haley didn't get to plus five or minus five in New Hampshire, she was in trouble. And I think, you know, as you look back at the results, she was minus, I think, 11 or 12. So her campaign is in trouble. Why is she hanging in the election? Why is she hanging around the hoop? And I think it's because she hasn't had a direct debate. She hasn't had a direct election with Donald Trump yet that she's had time to prep for. And the Donald Trump saga, and with all of the lawsuits and what have you, is still coming together. So to just, you know, have the path cleared so that it's Biden versus Trump, that's what Biden and Trump both want. They both want that head to head. Like that's the one thing that, that they can agree on. For Nikki Haley to stay around and see what happens is probably worth her time. Now, I'll give you a time when this didn't work out. I was working for Senator Clinton in 2008 and she hung around because, she, because of, of what was going around with Obama. And it turned out to be a complete waste of time. She never closed the gap. He went on to the nomination. And she just, you know, stuck around and, and maybe that wasn't the right decision. I think with Nikki Haley, she's trying to get through South Carolina, get to Super Tuesday, and then she makes a decision. But she wants that one debate, that one moment against President Clinton, President Trump, and she'll see what happens. Is she going to get that, though? Like, is that realistic? Will he debate her? Because I, I can't see him doing that. So yeah, she doesn't I, get that. Is she out? Even if she, he doesn't do it in a direct debate, he's doing it now. He's in the process of debating her, and she has a constituent of voters that he has to, he should be, I don't, you know, I'm not talking to him. He should be careful. He's got suburban women. If you go back and look at all the elections in the past five or six cycles, suburban women elect the president of the United States. That is a fact. You can go look at all the data. Uh, it's the most important demographic. It's probably the only persuadable demographic, and it's incredibly important. So if he, I think he needs to be careful. He needs to be respectful. And I think he does need to engage with her. What does she, Sarah obviously has a hand up here. Yeah, We're going to go you. to Sarah real quick, though. What does she have to gain 
from Super Tuesday. Like, what would a win look like for her? She's not going to beat Trump, clearly. So what, what would a win look like? It, it's all about delegates. It's all about having influence. And it also, it, Nikki Haley might be playing for 2028. She might be playing to have influence, but she's bringing a constituency with her. And just before we jump to Sarah, I'm not saying necessarily, I think Hillary found out, women don't necessarily vote for women because they're women. That's not what I'm talking about with these suburban, with these suburban women. What I'm talking about is smart, sophisticated, pragmatic women who are, are highly engaged. In the Clinton times, they called them soccer moms. You've heard them during the Bush era. They were called security moms. They, they've had various names over the years. They are incredibly thoughtful and are the most important swing group of voters. Let's go to Sarah. Thank you, Mike. I wanted to ask you, you, you said, you know, Nikki Haley wants to hold on. And you also said that Trump and Biden want it to be Trump and Biden. So why, as a, a strategist, do you think that her people are asking her to hold on for so long when it seems like that it that there is no rhyme or reason to it unless it's for a 2028 run. But doesn't it seem as though she is just trying to take away votes for Donald Trump rather than sort of tow her party line? What's What would be their strategy, do you think? I think there's three things. One, Nikki Healy has gone from a 1% not really part of the conversation to be left in a one-on-one. -on -one. So she's gained stature. She's gained credibility and it puts her in a great position. Two, all the exit polling has showed that she has an important demographic who are supporting her and she represents a point of view. Three, and again, I'm going a little bit out there. Donald Trump has a lot of issues circulating around him. Keeping, keeping the engagement going for a few months after getting beyond just two states that have voted, that's good for politics. That's good for, that's probably good for the Republican Party. It doesn't have to be an inevitability. Correct me if I'm wrong, we're still in January. Like this is, it's a long- <laughs> That's crazy, um, isn't it? Yeah, like I'm 55 years old, so I might be older than a lot of people who are on this podcast, but to have an election done in January, that is, that's why I'm saying we're 11, we're, 10 months away from election day, nine months away from election day. So many things can go on. Sticking around and going through a few more elections isn't her, you know, being a sore loser. I think it's her still trying to make her case to voters. And the last point I'll make here, and I was curious about this as, as I was thinking about it. Are there any persuadable voters going into this election? I mean, if it's Trump versus Biden, don't you kind of know where you stand now? Like, if I'm a Biden voter, are you going to convince me to vote for Trump? If I'm a Trump voter, are you going to convince me to vote for Biden? Like, who is the persuadable audience here? And I think it's suburban women. So I want to get into that. But briefly, you had mentioned to me on a different on that other show that we all kind of look at polling and strategy as to win the presidency this year. And what you had told me after that first interview during the Iowa caucuses you had said after the winner was announced, you were like, you know, Haley really has some great momentum. She's really gained, gained a lot of steam. Everyone's paying attention to that. Ron DeSantis will probably drop out. It doesn't look good for him. And I'm like, dude, Ron DeSantis won, like he's won second place in the caucuses. Haley placed third. And of course, DeSantis is the one who dropped out and Haley in it. So to your point, is it 2028? Is that the whole point here? She realizes that she has no shot at the presidency and she's basically getting the momentum for next time? Is this all her looking at 2028? Is that the whole point? I don't think she thinks she has no shot. I think she feels it's a long shot. She had what she's seen is she has an, a demographic that is critical to this election and she is going to keep speaking to them, engaging with them and gaining their trust. Can I, can I, we'll go to Evie, then Evie first, then Jason. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I want to answer to Mike that he was talking about the suburban woman. I don't think Nikki Haley is going to be able to attract that crowd because like you said, this group of people are very smart and they are not going to fall for Nikki Haley being a little bit 
I don't know. Do you guys lose a uh, connection? Because I've got a nose in here. Yeah, it looks like there's a connection issue. Just keep yes. talking, and if we lose so, the space, we'll try to restart it. I don't it. think Nikki Haley is capable of getting these people out to vote because, number one, they are very sophisticated, and they can see right through Nikki Haley. In 2020, one, because I campaigned in 2020, and one way to get the suburban women in a very weird way, it was by using low cabin, which is the gay Republicans. And this is what happened. Trump gave a hand to the gay Republicans at the time. They gave about a million dollars so they can go and campaign. They started the coalition to Trump pride. And what they realized is that every time they were campaigning, they start getting not only the gays, but they start getting the housewives and suburban women that love the gays. And that's how, I mean, nobody realized it at the time, but it was great. And right now, the low cabin is part of the RNC, and they are going to get more money to bring the women out. So I have been present, and I've seen the campaign that low cabin was doing at the time. And as a woman, and by the way, Nikki Haley's husband is half Albanian, so I should be biased since I'm Albanian. But honestly, everybody can see through her lies. And one more thing I want to say to Sarah she was asking before, why is she still in the game? I am shocked that DeSantis, you know, dropped out way before Nikki Haley did. Nikki Haley is not holding on because of 2025, because she's got way too many donors behind her. And these donors are not spending this kind of money now. So may she may run in 2028. They have a plan for right now. The way I see it is they want to push Nikki Haley so maybe Trump can take her on the ticket and then go after Trump with one of the lawsuits, get him out of the way and put Nikki Haley. That's my opinion. I don't think it's going to happen. MAGA is very smart and everybody else is very smart. You know, not to fall for that. But again, my, I don't think Nikki Haley has the capability to bring the voters of the housewives for Trump or anybody else. I think Jason, unless Mike, you wanted to respond to that, I think Jason was up. Yeah, I'll jump in. I just want to say, I totally agree that Haley is this sort of substitute candidate. It makes sense for her to stay in, to continue to get delegates. And it's sort of, you know, if Trump gets removed from the process in any way, he's that establishment candidate waiting the wings. I think it's really interesting. I didn't expect Ronna McDaniel to come out today. I saw this article break just a couple hours ago where she's calling on Haley to drop out, which is surprising. You know, I mean, yeah, that was wild. Yeah, the vague was like the one calling for her to resign from the stage at the debate is now Trump's like right hand guy on the, on the campaign trail. And so I'm just curious what your thought might be about why she's doing that right now. It's, it just seems odd to me. I'm surprised by it. Is she trying to protect her job? Yeah, that is a good question. Point? Maybe. I don't know if Mike has a perspective on that, but I was I, wondering the same thing, Jason. I, I think let's look at unity as if you're the RNC chair, party unity is your job. Donald Trump has won two decisive victories. He wants unity. Others are pressuring her for unity. And so it's not surprising that she would want a unity. Is Nikki Haley being defiant? I don't think so. Does, you know, but is she slowing down unity? Absolutely. Remember, our job is not to keep uncertainty going. Her job is to get the party aligned and go forward. And maybe she just sees the writing on the wall that, you know, if she kisses the ring to Trump a little bit right now, she might be able to hang on to her job. That's after it. All this is That's over. it, Jason. Yeah. She's trying to survive. That's why she's doing that. Do you guys remember it on the other side, on the Democratic side, where they were trying to get Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and everybody to drop out and they wouldn't do it? I'm just saying like, and then I, I'm kind of I'm spacing out her name. The Congresswoman Debbie from um, Sermon Schoen. Yeah, remember? And then she got canned. I think you're because confusing 2020 and 2016. I was saying 20, 2016. In South Carolina. Yes. Yeah. So I'm just saying like there are, the, the party chairmen have roles. Party chairs are typically supposed to be neutral. In fact, I think it's that's in the bylaws of both parties. And, is, and it's why Wasserman Schultz got into so much trouble right. when she was DNC chair in 2016. One thing I don't, I just joined, but one thing I have heard is no one who runs for president ever really ends their campaign. They always suspend it. And that is normally just a, a formality that is for you know fundraising purposes and, and that kind of thing. But the Trump's legal troubles, I think you, the reason you'll see DeSantis stay in 
formally. And Haley's going to stay in uh, as long as she can, and she'll actively campaign for as long as, as she wants to, I, I suppose, is just this theory that Trump could get hit by a bus, legally speaking. I mean, that's why this happens. And in, in previous years, you, you know, you saw Bernie Sanders suspend his campaign in 2020. He, he never ended it. And the other also rands uh, who made it, at least who made it past New Hampshire, did the same thing. So that, that's not uh, unusual for that to happen. And there's no, there's no real like ulterior motive behind suspending your campaign versus, uh, versus shutting it down. It's just how things are done. But I think the statement that came out from McDaniel was interesting because technically I, I, I believe it's a, a violation of the RNC bylaws. The RNC is supposed to stay neutral until there is a nominee and this weird idea that they're going to consider Trump the presumptive nominee after two contests, I, I'm not sure if that is going to fly, at least if, if people actually care about the rules. You don't really become a presumptive nominee until you've gotten the requisite number of delegates. And once that happens, then yeah, she can shift into being a, a full-time cheerleader for Trump. But I'm, I'm not sure if she's going to want to really poke that bear and, and not be at least somewhat neutral because it could cause problems for her and the RNC and for future chairpersons in, in the future yeah. by setting yeah, that you're, precedent. You're, Andrew, you're absolutely right. I'm curious. I am, I am curious to see what the strategy is here, but I know that good logic has had his hand up for a little while. Well, so. well before, before we do that, I do. I want to go on what Andrew was saying here. And I want to ask Mike, because what Andrew was referring to was this news report today that the RNC is actively considering a resolution to declare Donald Trump presumptive nominee for the Republican Party. You know, you were a political strategist, uh, strategist before for, you know, some pretty high profile figures. Is that a, number one, is that the right thing to do? Are voters going to see that as, you know, a little bit shady? And is that actually going to harm Trump in the long run? I think it, I, again, I, I'm on the Democrat side. It did harm Hillary. It, it was. Oh, well, that's interesting. So it, I did. I, I'm telling you, that's why I referenced the W. Rosserman Schultz. Like that was. You know, that was causing a rift in the party that they felt like they were shutting it down. So, I, you know, I can't speak specifically, but I think that you're right. The, you're, you had, there's a process, follow the process. This actually relates to what I wanted to talk about a little bit, which is this weird stage that we're in uniquely with Donald Trump, which nobody in living memory has ever been in. We have a former president who is now lost under very hotly debated terms, which left a large, uh, millions of Americans angry and frustrated that he's not the sitting president right now. And believe many of them believing that, that he was completely robbed of it. Now he's running for president a term later. And his status as incumbent versus not incumbent is something that we see both sides sort of play in the sense that when he won, so a lot of MAGA was calling it historic. And a lot of people on the other side were basically saying, well, he's the incumbent that's supposed to dominate. And they were seeing the same thing from MAGA's side, which is basically saying, hey, why is Nikki Haley still here? Well, if we're going to look at him, to be fair, if we're going to look at him as completely a non-incumbent, we've never seen a primary end after just New Hampshire. I mean, that's just, if, if he was just a complete non-incumbent, we would think it's crazy for everyone to be falling out of the race right after New Hampshire. And I think that this confusion is because we are in this unique circumstance. I'm not assessing that, that labeling or mislabeling to, to any side here. I'm just trying to recognize the situation for what it is and to urge my fellow MAGA people to be patient and recognize that he's not an incumbent. And because he's not an incumbent, yeah, we all have grown to hate Nikki Haley. And for good reason, I'm landing my plane here. I mean, the more she talks, I think the more she hurts for her political future because she's so alienating in the way she's been pushing for this campaign, uh, more so lately than she was at first. But Except I'm just even saying that it's unique circumstance. Even an running? incumbent president running for re-election has to be renominated. That's why there, correct. there are you're correct, letters. and I you're you're completely correct, and I agree with you. I think it would hurt him if he deemed the presumptive nominee. We all saw how that definitely hurt Hillary, and I think that it's much healthier for for Donald's campaign if he just goes into Super Tuesday and thumps the living daylights out of her, and that is a healthy way. For Americans to say, okay, this was democracy playing out. He is not being 
he's not being deigned king or, or royalty by people, by the elites, but that the public has spoken and it's very clear that he's the strong majority and that's why he's, and that's why he's our nominee. Yeah, uh, okay, but on the flip side of this though, if he were to be declared the presumptive nominee, pretty much, you know, we can stop going down this kind of, I mean, it's a lot of people would argue that it's a total waste of time. It's a lot of Nick, money. it doesn't mean anything. Waste. A resolution doesn't mean anything. The delegates have to be elected. So there have to be the primaries and, and the caucuses and the state conventions and that whole process. An RNC resolution declaring him the presumptive nominee, it does not. It does not mean anything. Uh, the part well, do you no think that, that her fundraising would dry up at that point? No, I don't think I don't think her fundraising would dry up at that point. I think all it would do is piss off a lot of people who would see it as, in a way, unfair. And I think it would help her in the end. You know, right right now, it's she's sort of running a you know chaotic you know suicide run against Trump in these upcoming primaries. Even and even in her home state, she's not expected to win. But people react in unpredictable ways when they see the thumb putting being put on the scales in any instance. And to that point, you said something interesting, Andrew. I don't want to lose it because you mentioned uh, her losing, potentially losing in her home state. So this could be Mike or anybody else. But Mike, does that really hurt her future potential if she gets thumped in her own state? Does that really tarnish the brand from a comm standpoint? I think she's managing the fact that she's going to get thumped in her home state. I believe that she's trying to get to Super Tuesday where there's a broader... I, I don't think she's in any way, shape, or form trying to say she's going to win South Carolina. This isn't I mean, like a favorite son, favorite daughter uh, no, election. She will not do that she anymore. Even pretend, she doesn't even pretend that it is. I think the, what, what I'm feeling is that she's trying to get to Super Tuesday. She's trying to get through Michigan. And at that point, she will have a, a substantial number of delegates and she'll be in it. Or at that point, I think she would make a decision. I think we're talking, I don't know if anybody has this specific date of Super Tuesday, but it can't be more than a month out. How far is it? You got to like Google March that 4th. one. Yeah. So it's, it's <laughs> South Carolina is at the end of February. But when no, Super Tuesday, Tuesday is, is like March, Tuesday. March 4th. Either way, like I, that's 30. Who wanted to say, days? hold on? Who, oh, that, who, that, I can't that identify Nate. who that was saying, hold on. I, I, I wanted to ask one thing about the Haley campaign. Like something like 70% of her voters from New Hampshire and like 40% of her voters from Iowa said they wouldn't vote for Trump. So, so who is she running? Like the, that I think matters because what's her path to victory? If most of her vote, I don't think she's running for president this term. I think she's running to say, I'm the alternative if Trump wins or loses. Because Trump is a full four years and out anyway. So she's running it for me personally. I think she's running to say, hey, I can bring people together in four years, but this is just nonsense. I don't, she, she knows that she can't win. There's no possible way, especially if, the, if her own voters say they're not voting for Trump, then she's running a, essentially third party and then the primaries. Well, so here's the thing. They're not in love with her. Or they just don't like Trump. And that's, yeah, I'm with you. That, that's not the right strategy. Well, so Jack, as you point out, a lot of people are in this and they don't like Trump and they don't like Biden. So I'm really curious, Mike, just to move the conversation on, if we are looking at a Biden Trump run a, a Biden Trump election, which it really doesn't look like that's what's, what it's going to be. And if you interview people on the street, almost everyone's like, yeah, I don't want to vote for either of them. But we are probably looking at a Trump Biden thing. And so do we see like a huge drop in voter turnout this year because no one really wants to vote for either one of them? I think that's polite talk between people, to be honest with you, because, I mean, there was a lot of benefits to Trump being in office. I think the Democrats masterfully created the scenario where there was just so much drama around President Trump. And, and I mean, I think President Trump, I support him. I love his policies, but his persona, the the way he handled himself invited a lot of it, which, you know, a lot of us wish he would have probably pulled back a little bit. But I think that's just play talk. People are still going to come out. There's a lot of major issues on the table, you know, way beyond even, even immigration policies. I mean, people could say their 401 is great, but that's a three-leg table right now. I mean, if the feds actually start to lower the interest rates, you know, historically, job loss goes through the roof. I mean, layoffs start happening and they already are happening in the tech sector. So I think that's just play conversation. I believe people are still going to come out and I'm, you know, 
we're never going to count out the Democrat machine or the Trump machine and messaging and how they're going to get people motiv- emotional and motivated and out to the polls. That's my answer. Yeah, I think Donald Trump, you know, he likes to talk about how how he brings the turn, how he brings Republican turnout through the roof, although not according to New Hampshire or Iowa results. But he does also have an effect of boosting Democratic turnout. So your people, I think, who are saying they, they don't want a Biden Trump rematch, well, too bad's what they're gonna get. And people are gonna deal with the choices in, in front of them in November. But I think there are also a lot of people, and and this factors in, into Biden's kind of lackluster polling, is that a lot of people seem to be under the impression that they're not going to have a Biden-Trump rematch. That there's going to be this deep ex machina, and it's going to be, I don't know, someone versus Michelle Obama or, or things like that. That's simply not going to happen. And people aren't paying attention they're tuning out the news, which is you know not great if you're in my my, my line of work. But as November you know creeps up on the calendar, they're going to start tuning in again. And then I think you have that that double edge turnout machine for Republicans and Democrats. And the question will be who people uh, dislike less in the end, and also whether Donald Trump can bring over enough Haley voters. And enough people who voted for him the first time around, but voted for Biden in 2020. And that's going to take a big pivot on his part. And uh, having covered him since 2015, I, I don't know if he can make that pivot, but we will see. He's got some smart people behind him. So I appreciate everybody. Real quick, I appreciate everybody joining. I've asked Mike to be on this because he's a uh, former Clinton strategist in the White House and with Senator Clinton and with Mayor Bloomberg. And Mike, I'm not sure. I know you got kind of dropped the signal and then you got back on here in a second. So I got I want to ask you another question. Then we'll go to Nicholas and Jason. But I think you got like booted right as I was asking you a question, which is we have two candidates that no one likes. And so are we going to see voter turnout decrease? That's an interesting question. I don't know if no one likes them. I think both of them have their bases. An interesting question. And, and I think this is at the heart of the questions around the 2020 election is there's a lot more, there won't be voting, there won't be COVID election voting laws like there were in 2020. Donald Trump, from what I've heard, and again, somebody can dispute this, I think he won on election day, but I don't think he had won all the votes that had been sent in before election day and counted afterwards. Turnout should be, I would think that turnout should be pretty good on the Republican for Trump. And we'll see what turnout looks like for Joe Biden. So because everyone's kind of pre-decided or like, I don't know, pre-suaded, is that even a word? Pre-suaded? I I invented that here. Because everyone's kind of in that camp then, it's about discouraging your opposition to vote for their candidate and encouraging your base to vote for you, basically. It's about decreasing turnout on the other side, essentially, right? Suburban, the suburban women I'm talking about are voting. All right, Nick and Nicholas. Thank yeah, then Jason. I'll just say, you know, with all the talk of the dissatisfaction of the candidates, if we look at a lot of election cycles, we see that the, a lot of Americans are dissatisfied with the candidates going back to 2020, 2016. We go all the way back to 1992, where 40% of the electorate was unhappy with Bush, Clinton, and Perot. So people are going to vote. They're going to go out and vote. Now, I don't expect voter turnout to be as high as it was in 2020. 2020 was an unusual year, and we did see high turnout. But given that things are are back to normal, at least semi-normal, you're going to see a little bit of a decrease. The question is going to be independent. Where did independence go? And this is where I'm conservative, and I look at 2022, and usually in midterm elections, independents go for whatever party is in the minority. In 22, they didn't. 48% 48% went for Democrats, 46% went for Republicans. So Republicans have to get a wider share of the independent vote in this presidential election if Trump is to get back into office. And so he needs to stop talking about Nikki Haley, pretend she's not even a factor anymore, and just go straight to the general. I, I think, yeah, yeah at, you know, I, I think if we, you know, we take everything at 2020 was an anomaly in many ways, as you mentioned. And if we take it at face value, right, like Trump, lost by 100,000 votes between a couple of uh, handful of states. And 
we had people who didn't experience three years of Biden, which I think, you know, he's got high unfavorables. Trump increased his overall vote totals by 10 million when, you know, I think that was kind of a shocker for some people. And so I do think it has just a lot to do with where the momentum is. And I, I think right now the momentum seems to be with Trump. Now, I think it's a toss up, but I do think that, you know, people, Biden doesn't have the benefit of being this guy who really wasn't out there hardly at all during that campaign. And people now have a record to, to look at and just make those very basic, is my life better or not? So I definitely am seeing a Trump victory if everything's above board and nothing, black swan events don't happen. And Jason, if we look at 2020, look at the libertarian candidate and all those places where Trump lost by maybe 10,000 votes, Georgetown had 12, 13, 15,000 votes. So this year, there's no real talk about the libertarian candidate. How does that change things? How does Robert F. Kennedy Jr. change things? That's, oh, that's a great point. You know, the libertarians don't have a great candidate this year, no matter who sh turns up for it. And But the RFK question is a possibility. I have no idea what's going to happen with him being able to have ballot access, being on the ticket. So I, I would see that as kind of a black swan. Jason, liber I mean, it always seems like libertarians don't really, they can't organize to actually get anywhere. And uh, just an example of that is I was doing interviews during the Iowa caucuses and the libertarian candidate whose name escapes me right now, his comms person DM'd me like a day before the caucuses or maybe a few days before the caucuses saying, hey, can we get him on the show? I'm like, dude, where, where have you been? Yeah. Uh, so I don't, you know, it always seems like they're running to complain, not necessarily to, and, and to like maybe raise a stink about certain issues. But I just wonder if, and I don't have any insider information, but I really wonder if they're actually seriously wanting to run to get the presidency. But well, that's a yeah. completely different topic. I just wanted to say, you know, I'm on this panel as somebody who voted for Gary Johnson in 2016. I didn't vote for Trump in 2016. I didn't, I wasn't on board with Trump. I saw what happened during the 2020, saw the media came after him, how the establishment came after him. And I started to say, wait a minute, maybe this guy is dangerous to something I didn't realize. Like maybe he's dangerous and hated by the same people that as a libertarian, I hated those people. <laughs> you know, I, many of the things were resonating, but I just didn't see him as what I've come to see him as. And so then I voted for Trump in 2020. And so I have also seen a massive shift in, you know, libertarian, influential libertarians, if you can call libertarians influential, but I'm talking about influencers and other things like that, who've come along and come on board with Trump. They were, a lot of them were really supportive of the deck. And now they're saying like, look, Trump on some very key issues, Trump is more appealing to them. So I think Trump's the one who's going to capture those libertarian votes. Now, general independence, it's hard to say, but still, I think that we've got three years of Biden and especially with immigration becoming such a big issue this year, I, I do think the momentum's with Trump. So Jack, then good. And then I have another question for you, Mike, about issues versus personalities. Hey, Justin, what I wanted to talk about here and add in is the Joe Manchin wild card. So I know through friends, and this is a great source of information, he's out courting billionaires to raise money to possibly jump in as an independent himself. So what, it, what happens to the race then? We have JFK or RFK, I'm sorry, which, you know, outside of the vaccine, is about a socialist is he could be AOC's dad. And then you have Joe Manchin, which is pretty much Joe Biden light. So how's it go there? Because the source I have it from is credible. And he's he literally was just spotted this past week with uh, some billionaires trying to get them on board. Your thoughts? Joe Manchin takes votes from Biden, not Trump. That's where that. OK, so who else on that one? Because when I spoke to some of my guys in my camp, we think they're taking them from from you know, from Trump in some ways. I mean, I haven't seen that. So I doubt you're going to get any panelists to confer to comment on something that's, you know, they can't personally confirm, but maybe good logic. Let's go to you. Yeah. I'm curious about what Andrew Weissman said earlier. I know he fell either left or fell off, but where he said that there's no way it's not going to be Biden. We're definitely looking at it, it's going to be Biden v. Trump. And I really think that's that, I think that's a little bit of an unusual take. I mean, the, the Democrats have to know that Biden won by, you know, by the ballot tally, he won by under 100,000 votes spread across four or five different states. So, and that was when he had an unfavorable rating of 
or like, you know, or favorability rating of like 50%. Now he's lost 15 points off of that. And while I agree, I think that when Trump is there, by the way, I think that the polling number, I think the ballot numbers will increase by 10 to 15 million because he's so polarizing of both people voting for and against him. So if he's in there, I don't think our vote tally is going to be low at all. But I am curious whether, let's say Mike here thinks that it's such, it's so locked in that Democrats are not going to try to find a way to shunt Joe to the side and replace him with, I don't know, Gavin Newsom with a uh, Michelle Obama undercard or some other ticket that they think might have more success running against Trump in 2024. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Mike? That is a good point. I don't think that we know the final candidates yet on either side. I'm not sure I'd buy into the Michelle Obama theories that have been circulating around, but the, the facts are the facts on Joe Biden. Uh, he's getting older. He's, he's fragile. We can see it. And we know that there's not a, a tremendous amount of love for him, even within the Democratic Party. So he's probably not their strongest candidate, but it's kind of hard to convince about an 81-year-old, 82-year-old to change his mind. So I'm just going to put that out as, as some statements without having a next statement to say. On, on the, uh, well, on, on that note, though, I'm going to go to Brian, Jeff, Nickel. But uh, on that note, you bring up something interesting, Mike, which is this a, is this really an election of Trump versus Biden or is this an election of their VPs against each other? Because I guess this is one of the first. Is this the first election where age is actually going to be a central issue? Kamala is going to be a central issue. She's coming up all the time already. She's a loser for Biden. She doesn't test well. She doesn't pull well. So he is in, I mean, he is in a very tough position because it is weird that they're still running Biden. It is bizarre to me, but it's a delicate position where Kamala doesn't test well. Biden, you know, age is apparent. Trump age, he's getting up there too, obviously. And so it's almost a, I, do, do, do we see people switch out VP? I mean, obviously Trump can pick whoever he wants as VP. Is there a scenario where they run Joe Biden, but pick out another VP? How do you step over a black woman, the first black woman for VP? How do you do that? Yeah, that seems to have come, come back and bit him in the ass because, you know, at this point, it seems like the uh, general consensus is that she was merely a diversity hire. She doesn't really have any sort of skills at all. And, you know, I know, Nate, maybe you're laughing at that. Sounds like you have, might have something to say on that. Do you think Kamala was a choice based on merit or was it because she was a black Asian Indian woman? Well, I do think the Democrats like to check boxes and the fact that she did check boxes was a plus. But I also think, too, Biden was in a maybe Bi- that back Biden was in a weird position because he remember he was really down at the beginning and then the black vote overwhelmingly sent him over the top. So I think he felt like he owed it to him. And then he even kept on with that policy. I'm going to appoint the first black woman to the Supreme Court. And then everybody was like, yeah, you know, so. He, I, I think he's playing to the base. He knows how, hey, I got to check these boxes when it comes up to, to support. But I think the problem with Biden going into November is that usually Democrats, you need about, about 80 to 90 percent of the black vote. Right now, Biden is polling at about, what, 50, 60 percent with 30 percent, like 37 percent undecided. Or, and I think there's like a percentage of that says they're going to go for Trump. Trump is like has one of the largest percentage of the black vote of any Republican president going into an election cycle. So I think right now, all those checking boxes worked well, but I think this migrant crisis has really, the poor people that Democrats focus on to manipulate, the migrant crisis, I think, has exposed that because now they have to shift all those funds, let's say in New York and Chicago, from the poor people who depend on them to now the migrants. So now, like you see in Chicago, we, the person who took, like, who's now the, a lot of the, the on the ground people in Chicago are saying that they're voting Republican. Not because they like Trump, it's because they want to see the end to the migrant crisis. The number one issue in Iowa was the migrant crisis. They don't have any migrant issues, but it's the migrant crisis. So I think as long as that issue stays, I think Trump has, to be fair, a real opportunity because I think a lot of those Democratic voters who Biden depends on to vote for him and to put him over the top either won't come out or are going to switch based on this issue. I mean, as in Iowa, and a lot of the thing that was driving the conversation in this state, though, was a lot of economic stuff, not necessarily the border. I think the border matters, but I think the economy is more immediate for at least people in Iowa. You know, we're, Iowa tends to be insulated from a lot of stuff that other states deal with. I did make a promise, Brian. Let's go to Brian and then Jeff and Nicholas after that. Thank you, sir. And by the way, her name's Kamala, not Kamala, but I think there's a lot of copium being consumed here because Biden's already named Harris as his running mate for this cycle. There's a lot of media speculation because the talking heads love to speculate about this kind of stuff. But it's been pretty clear 
that he's not changing horses for his VP. It's going to be Trump and who knows who. Definitely not Mike Pence. We know that much. And it's going to be Biden Harris. And I think you guys can have fun, you know, spitballing about who's going to take on Joe and who are they. Is it going to be new summer, Michelle? It's if none of that's happening. If there's some kind of crazy health problem or he somehow died or Trump died, that's how we would get different nominees. But that's what we're going to have. And in terms of, you know, I just want to ask a quick question from the last speaker and then reclaim my time. But what percent of the black vote do you think Trump got in 2020? I think it's less than 10 percent. I don't think it's a huge number. Yeah, yeah. it was actually 12. He did better, four points better than he did in 2016, which was 8 percent. But the thing is, you know, that a small shift, you make a good point, a small shift can have a big difference. But I do think that with Trump doing what he's doing now, the way he's attacking different people, in particular, a number of black legislators very popular with African-American voters, I don't think he'll stay at 12. I think after January 6th as well. I remember a, a guy talking on the bus to me, a black guy, about this right after January 6th. And he was like, man, if I did that, what that guy did, I'd be in jail right now. And so I think this framing in particular is that's very insulting to a lot of African-American Democratic voters and even some Republicans is this, this framing of this, the prosecutions against Trump for what he did as being examples of a two-tier justice system. When African-Americans have been suffering under the realities of a two-tier justice system that's bent against them for this man of extreme privilege and wealth who gets to scream at, at court in the middle of proceedings and, and, and yell at witnesses and do witness intimidation and not get anything more than a slap on the wrist for them to be making this argument over and over again. It's a real insult to a lot of that. Okay, can, can I speak to that point real quick? Because I, I, I think you're miscapped because there's an empathy piece that I think you're missing. The black people who have been, who the system has oppressed and trumped up charges and all that, they don't see Trump as, you know, as you're trying to make it seem like they see Trump as some white hero. No, what they're saying, what they see is someone who else who's also being screwed by the system. And they're saying that this guy who's being screwed by the system, just like us, he can relate to that. Now, do I think that's going to give him, you know, 40% of the black vote? No. But that is what I think the, it's why you see now the rap songs about Trump and people saying, yes, we, we like Trump because he understands the struggle with the government is after us. The government is doing everything. And whether it's true or not, if all these cases are nonsense or not, it's the perception. And I think that's how it's being perceived. And just one last point about the polls. Trump now is currently polling at like 20 to 25 percent amongst the black community. That may not hold for the election, but that's a lot higher than 12 percent. So that's what I'm saying. I think Biden needs that 80 to 90 percent of the black vote. And right now he's just not getting it. Now, things may change. You're talking about November. But I think Trump, I think people see Trump as a vehicle to F the system. Pardon me. Well, to they see oh. Trump as money. They to see Trump, Trump as to money. Trump. Period. To respond to that, since I was speaking before, yeah, sorry about going that. back and forth. With no, it's fine. To respond to that, I, I know that a fair number of Trump's black supporters, this is among the 12 percent, which I think is less now. Sure, that's how they see it, but that's not how most people see it. And that's not how most African-Americans who are still Democrats see it. And I do think that some of his supporters are going to be so offended by the day. The overwhelming amount of discussions I've followed among different intellectuals, journalists, people I know following online is that the typical black American takes that as an insult for a millionaire who has gotten away with so many lawsuits that were settled. He's never been held accountable for his financial and business crimes. He's never been held accountable for any of these other crimes until right now, for him to claim that he's a victim, like an African-American who was wrongfully imprisoned or executed even when they didn't commit a, a murder, when you go back to Jim Crow and all that stuff, and that there's some people still having suffered or alive today and have been wrongfully imprisoned, I, I just think it's a real slap in the face to a lot of people. And the last point I'll make is about the polls. Polls now don't matter, except in the primaries. They don't matter right now because just ask President Al Gore, President Hillary Clinton, ask George H. Dubb's second term White House officials. The polls fluctuate wildly between now and November. And I think a lot of people, myself included, were benefiting from having Trump be in the background and off social media in a lot of ways for the last few years. Now he's front and center on our TVs every day. And it's going to be that way between now and November. And a lot of people that had been doubting Biden or whatever, a lot of those people are going to come back because they're going to be reminded how awful Trump was, how awful he will be. And he's honestly sounding even worse than he did before. And I, he, people want to talk about Biden's cognitive issues. When Trump speaks at length for any time, it's just like, what is going on up there? 
Biden might stumble over his word a little bit, but he's talking about the issues and numbers. <laughs> he actually notes about that were related to policy. So, hey, I'll gentlemen. Hey, 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 Ryan, wait hey, a hey, second. Hey, Hold hey, on. Hey, I got to say this. Hey, I got to say this. I'm sorry. I have to say hey, this. Jack, I have a question. 12. Jack, I, I, hey, Nick Sorter. Nick Sorter. What's going on? It's like, that's what Joe Biden sounds like up on stage. I'm sorry, Brian. He just does. You can't understand him. What does sound like? Man? Are you playing? I mean, come on, man. A second, guys. I made a promise to Jeff and Nicholas. Let's go to Jeff. I know that Jeff had a question. You know, <laughs> Let's I, go I, to Nicholas. <laughs> Gosh. Justin, I'm so sorry, but somebody needs to respond to Brian here before you move on. And I apologize. But yeah, I was going to let Jack do it. But well, well, let me for just a moment, because Brian is somebody that on paper I should agree with. But every time he speaks, I find myself shaking. Well, my I'll head. just jump in. First, I don't pretend to speak for the black community. I don't know how really the black do. community is going to vote, but what's insulting to the black community. Wait, what just happened? Hold on. I, I, don't, know, I don't know. I'm sorry. But, you know, Brian, you are somebody that I should agree with, but I just can't. Some of the numbers and statistics that you are throwing out regarding the black vote, where are you getting these facts and figures? Is it anecdotal? Yes, I assume so. I'm looking at sure every election you're going back to 1930. I'm going to every election. To Brian, please. we got to stop the interrupting please. thing, please. These are facts. Please, please, sir. Okay, well, you know what? Google, Let's look him up. Eight. Okay, dude, I'm going to remove you if you don't stop. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, sir. I don't interrupt you, and I don't interrupt anybody typically. But these figures that you throw out, they just don't make sense. And yes, people on the left say that Trump has cognitive issues. People on the right say Biden has cognitive issues. But guess what? They're both right. Trump has issues. Biden has issues. They're not young men. Okay, so we have to stop looking at them like they're 25 years old. We have to look at them like they are. They're aging men. That's fine. But when you use that as stating that people will not vote for Donald Trump because he's an elderly gentleman, or because he is perceived to be persecuted, you are wrong. And this is the problem. People talk about why did Hillary Clinton lose the election in 2016? And it could be, you know, all kinds of reasons. But you know what? It's so basic because Democrats like you, Democrats like me, we all got complacent. We all sat back and we laughed at Donald Trump and we thought he's not a threat. But look, that guy came in and he smashed Hillary Clinton. And guess what's going to happen in 2024? He's going to smash Joe Biden because you don't take that base seriously. And if you are listening to these spaces, instead of screaming at people, you would hear, read the chat. These people have a... So movement. I think, Sarah, I think it would be I helpful. To, I think it would be Brian. really helpful. Hold up, guys. Brian, hold up for a second. Brian, hold up for a second. Sarah, I think it would be helpful to just pose a question to Brian so that he can actually respond to it. I, I think that would be really helpful. Land, land the plane. My oh, you don't have a question. Like, yeah. Got it. Definitely have to. So then I think we should, I think it would be fair then to at least let Brian respond to you because you were kind of coming at him a little bit and then we'll move on because I know that Jeff and Nicholas sure. also have Brian, questions. I, I don't mind her coming at me. I, I don't mind her coming at me. I mind her not having a clue about the facts. I was presenting the numbers from the share of the vote by the black vote and other debt going back to every election since 1932. And, and the black vote is what it is. We have this data. It's not like some numbers I'm making up. Okay. And this is election after election. Number one. Number two, I didn't talk about that was somebody else. I didn't bring that up. But yeah, he is. He's about the same age as Biden. Biden does have issues with his old stuttering issue. Now that he's older, he's not as able to control it. So he does stutter a bit and he does, you know, when he's not the most eloquent public speaker. And yeah, he stutters a bit, but he knows the issues that he's actually talking about. He knows the facts. He understands them. He knows these people that he's, he can talk about Hamas. He can talk about manufacturing jobs. He actually knows about things about the issues and can talk about them. Trump just rants and makes stuff up and calls his opponents nicknames and funny whatever and talks about invasion and uses all these like neo-fascist kind of like code words. So I'm just saying that when you want to compare, Biden can sit down in an interview and talk at length about Nick. Trump doesn't have that oh, ability. Oh, good, with Brian. I wanted to ask you that exact question. I wanted to ask you that exact question. question. You've had plenty of time, Brian. So I'm going to ask you a question based on what you just said. You said Joe Biden will sit down and do interviews and talk about the issues. When was the last time Joe Biden did an interview? I knew we did it with Tom Friedman well, not so long after the Hamas-Israel 
console. Oh, yeah. So October. Oh, October I, since he's sit down and done an interview. Well, it, well, maybe in November. I'm not sure. He may have done. I mean, I'm oh, not following it. November. I, okay. So months ago. I don't know. I don't have the answer. The United States cannot now. be bothered to I answer questions. From All right, right gentlemen. All right, gentlemen. No, I don't know. I'm staying on this point. I'm staying on this. Yeah, week. I know you are, but Jeff and Jeff's been Justin, pretty patient. Justin, so is Nicholas. So let's go to Jeff yeah, first, go. and then we'll go back into that later. That yet. We're not doing that yet. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna continue on with this. Okay. I want to to know how you can say, you know, Trump does interviews every single week, Brian. Every single week at this point. Okay, but you're gonna say that the sitting president of the United States cannot sit down with the media, can't take any questions from voters. I mean, and he's cognitively okay. What is he hiding from? I can't sure. hear any speakers. Yeah, um, there might be. A, I, was sorry, I, I, was I, I was on you. I was on you. He, I, I don't know when the last interview was. I've been following. It, it was the Corona more international. Show. They put it on to the Today but, Show. It, it wasn't that long ago. It was just last month. Okay, yeah. Appreciate so that, Grant. Thank you. Yeah. On governing. Yeah. It's right more focused on governing, and Trump is always more focused on the media. He spent half his days watching TV in his bed while he was president. Biden's out there doing stuff, and he's campaigning, and he's taking his message directly to the voters. And frankly, the media has done just a, such an awful job covering. I don't blame him for limiting. He, he should do interviews, and he does. He just limits it. He wants to frame his own message and not have the media skew things. Because what happens is he'll go and talk about the economy, <laughs> And the first question they'll ask him about is his age or Hunter Biden. So it's just the, the media is just so tabloidy at this point. It's really disappointing. So, yeah. And when he does these interviews, they're at least and he's quite good. Trump cannot do those. Watch the Jonathan Swan interview. He's off the rails. Look, what, what Brian, how okay. long have you had a drinking problem and when do you plan on addressing? You guys just admit. Come on, guys. That's not helpful. Recently was a total disaster was that Sean Hannity said. It was like, I, I'm stealing from Morning Joe. He said, this is like tee ball. And you set the ball on the tee and say, go ahead, son, hit the ball. And then he like, just doesn't even get close. I mean, Donald Trump's interviews are pretty bad and they're all in very friendly venues. Joe Biden was on 60 Minutes in October, for example. Not strictly a friendly venue at all, okay? Oftentimes a very difficult venue. But can, I'd like to say something. Thanks for inviting me, guys. My name is Grant Stern. I'm the executive editor of Rocket by Democrats. And I'd like to say something about this election that I feel is missing. And there's this like election prediction guy. I want to see what he says. Okay, well, Grant, we can get into that here in just a second. But I, I'm I need some balance here, so I'm going to go to Jack and then Nicholas, and then I'll let you kind of pivot the topic here a little bit. Uh, it was Jeff. It was Jeff then Nicholas. Go ahead. Okay, okay, but I need some balance here. Okay, so I'm going to go to Jack first because Jack's been trying to speak, and then we can go to Jeff or Nicholas. So go ahead, Jack. All right, thank you. Being from Chicago on the South Side, Brian. I, many of my friends, not like my token friends, like actual friends are black. And I speak to them about this. Some are Democrats, some are whatever, some don't care, and some are voting Republican. But one thing I will tell you, and one of my very good friends who's like, you know, on paper, we shouldn't even be friends. And he's actually flying in tomorrow to spend a weekend with me. He told me this, you know how I know things were good in the hood is because they had Drake, they had uh, window dressing in the hood. That's when people are making money. And he goes, I know it sounds funny, but if you want to know if things are good in the ghetto is if they have window dressing, he goes, and I told my family to stick with Trump and I know he's got a big mouth and all this stuff, but we make money. And now he went back to his family when everything happened and they used to give him a hard time because he was pro Trump. And then what wound up happening is they all started saying, yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, it's a small subsect. I get that. However, this is the South side of Chicago saying that I cannot imagine, you know, it being much different from the more the majority of the black community. I'm like, not your affluent black people, just your regular everyday black people. So that's Brian. I think white liberals are so disconnected from who real black people are. It's why you guys never get it right. They're going to swing. And in one hour point, Gen Z came out crazy because they hated Trump because you know, they stirred all the stuff up. Gen Z realized they got duped. Half of Gen Z is sitting at home this time. Promise you. I mean, Jeff, I, I appreciate the patience. Um, why don't we go to Jeff? I appreciate the patience. White people and they are behind Biden. I talked to more African Americans, white people about these issues recently. Most of the people I've been talking about politics with recently are people of color, and they are terrified of Trump as a fascist person who's going to end democracy. They're called black people. They hate being called people of color, Brian. He doesn't know that because he knows nothing about people, black people. I was including other people because Hispanic people, Asian people as well. I talked to a diverse array of people. 
But yes, African Americans, black people are are not in. African Americans, black people. You know, you know, you know so little about black, black people that you don't no, know. No, no, black. That's not- my word, guys. Let's can we cool it, please? Uh, I'm going to go to Jeff next. This could go on for another two hours. So let's go to Jeff. He's been more than patient. Appreciate it, Jeff. We got to have a little You're bit up. of debate, though, Justin. Man, I'm just letting you know this is supposed He's to be American studies. My goodness. Go ahead, Jeff. Poor guy waited Jeff, so long. And- you got to you try <laughs> again, buddy. Oh, Jeff was shocked. He got the mic. Here we hear you, Jeff. Okay. All right. My name is uh, Jeff Zink. I'm running for uh, U.S. Congress here in Arizona. Arizona's made the splash with the Carrie Lake, Jeff DeWitt debacle that he tried to bribe her and she refused and put it out there. And then Donald Trump did cancel the event for tomorrow. So he's not coming in because of the AZGLP and the corruption that's taking place. However, to one point, as a person who is actually knocking door to door, 64% of my constituents are Latino. I have 8% black population. I have 21% Caucasian. And then the rest is either Native American or other. And so the thing is that in talking to them, the number one thing that everyone is talking about here, because I'm on the south side of Phoenix, I live in the hood. It literally is what I, what they call it. And they've had a Democrat in that seat since it was created in 2000. 24 years later, we've gone from 12% below the poverty line to almost 70%. All of the manufacturing jobs have left this area. And every one of the constituents that I'm knocking on doors, talking to them directly, are saying that they have more month than money. They need good, uh, a paying job so that they can take care of their families. The uh, gas prices, the food prices are such a concern that they want to bring back Trump. And I have a 8% flip rate from Democrat to Republican when somebody engages and actually talks with me in regards to the policies that are in place. They don't care about the politics. They want to feed their family. They want their children to be educated, not indoctrinated. They want their little girls to stay in the bathroom and not have little boys there. All of these issues are the forefront, and I'm being hammered every day that I'm talking to people in that realm. So if you want to know more about me, go to jeffzink.vote, and you can look up my platform. But I'm on the, I'm literally knocking on doors, both Democrat and Republican, and that is a report of people that over the last three and a half years of 26,000 doors I've knocked on. And I'll turn back. Biden won your district. Appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you. God bless you. Biden won your district. 63 of 36. You're not going to win, do, buddy. I, I do want to agree with Brian with one thing. I, I think we all in here are trying to make it seem like, you know, Biden is automatically going to lose. I kind of get that feeling. But I really think this is a 50-50 because I, I don't think someone else earlier said Gen Z is going to be voting. No, that's not happening. They're overwhelmingly going to be voting for Biden. I still think that, yes, the black vote and the minority vote may Go, you know, back, go back and forth, but I still think he's going to get the majority of that. I honestly think at this point in time, Trump has to start pivoting to those independent voters because if he can't win independence, there's no way he's going to win the election. That's where the fight is now. Well, he's got to get through a primary first, but I would agree. What, what I did say is half of the Gen Z that came out to vote for Biden, I didn't say the whole sect, just half of the Gen Z because they got duped. That was my mistake. Sorry about that. Don't worry, brother. Just keeping the conversation going. Yeah, Nichols, I don't know if you spoke yet. I know you had your hand up for a while. Go ahead and jump in. Well, I'll, I'll oh, and actually, before you do, real quick, I just want to remind the audience here questions, concerns, tidbits of information. Maybe you have insider information. Maybe you want to criticize the panel or yell at me or something. The perfect place to do that is in the bottom right hand corner in that little purple build button. You hit that. It's good. It's much easier when you tag me in it. That way I can see it in my notifications. It makes everything a lot easier. So definitely do that. Also, there is a newsletter. But you can sign up for now at the top, pinned to the top of the page. And there's a Telegram channel as well. So make sure you do that if you enjoy our space. Can I just ask, can I ask just a quick question to the panel? Is anybody concerned about Trump peaking too early? Because him peaking now may hurt him when it comes to November. Like, this is not a good time to peak if you're, you know, the presumptive nominee. Yeah, Nicholas, I'll let you respond to that if you want to, or you can jump in with whatever you wanted to go with. Okay, two things. I, I don't think that he's peaking too early. I think the, the primary is pretty much over. 
And then we wait and see what the general election. As far as Gen Z goes, I'm in the classroom with these students each and every day. About 35% of my class is white, 35% Hispanic, 15% uh, black, 15 20%, and then the rest are Asian. And when you invoke Trump's name, you see passing. You, you see there's people that love him. There's people that despise him. Across the board, never see any of that type of passion when Biden's name is invoked in my classroom. And, and it does, it's revealing, but it, it's not, it's a microcosm of the country. Now, this is the most unpredictable election cycle, presidential election cycle that we've ever witnessed. There's so many variables that we've never seen before that we can't compare it to previous points in history. The one thing I will say, I think so many people are underestimating within the urban centers, keeping schools closed down for two years, we're at all-time low proficiency levels and the migrant crisis. I think people are underestimating how angry the residents in these areas are, particularly New York City, my area. And I think that this does have the potential. There's going to be a lot of voters that have never voted in their lives or haven't voted in years that are so angry that are going to come out and vote. And I don't think any polling is picking that up. Grant, what's up, dude? What's up? Thanks for having me on. So... I want to talk about comparing this election to others because I think that there's a lot of historical precedent that's relevant. And I want to start with the precedent of Harry Truman deciding not to run in 1952. People don't realize, but he actually didn't ask to be put on the New Hampshire ballot. When he found out he was on the New Hampshire ballot right before the primary in 1952, he actually wrote a letter asking for his name to be removed. And then one of his political advisors convinced him to leave his name on the ballot. Well, he lost by 10 points and decided not to run. So Joe Biden did something quite different, but still his name was not on the ballot. He won by a fairly convincing margin, all right? This is not like an election where you have someone that's so weak that they're falling apart. A lot of people want to think that a primary was going to undo Jimmy and Joe Biden like Jimmy Carter, for example, but that didn't happen either. And when it comes to the general election, I think that there's a very relevant precedent here that Ronald Reagan set in 1984. Ronald Reagan was the oldest president to, to enter office when he was elected by quite a bit. He entered office right after there was an inflation shock or as there was an inflation shock. And by 1984, or let's say by 1983, the polls were actually saying that John Glenn or Walter Mondale would be the next president of the United States. I mean, I have read the New York Times headline, Gallup poll, Mondale leads by seven. And he too faced the same, you know, problems that, you know, people said he was too old to be reelected, but the economy got pretty good in 1984 and he managed to turn his age issue into a non-issue through humor, through, you know, his performance in the presidential debates. And I think that Joe Biden has an opportunity to do actually the same thing. I mean, if we've ever... You know, but Graham, look at the economy now. Look at some of the issues. Uh, so that's this, right. This it's the economy, stupid. It's this is some feedback that we got from the audience here. We want to talk about. It's going to get up in the debate. Hold, 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 hold on a second. So look, we, we, dude, we've already it, hashed it, out it, the it, age it, thing. It, we've already hashed out the age thing. Okay, I want to go into policy a little bit more, Grant. I mean, look Let's at what's about, going on. Let's talk about Yes, the okay. So I want somebody up here to defend Biden's immigration policies at the border. Grant, try I'm to ready. defend it. Perfect. Okay, let's hear it. Let's go. So. Joe Biden already agreed to give Republicans everything they wanted. The Republican, uh, several Republican senators waved, went and gave a press conference last week, and they said, we've got the best deal we're ever going to get for border security. It doesn't even include a path to citizenship. And even if Trump is elected, this is a better deal that we're getting today than we would get if Donald Trump was elected, even if we won the House and the Senate and Donald Trump was elected. Does this that include is what down to the border and removing barriers and cutting razor wire this and is threatening the what state I'm talking of about. Texas. That is a diversion. Okay. It was a comprehensive That's a Biden. Can you let him that is a, he, hold on he, a second. Hold on. That is, like, that is, that is a Biden policy, you? though. It, is a, it was a comprehensive agreement for a border security package that Senate Republicans said is better than what you're going to get voting for Donald Trump. And they said this in public. Donald Trump quashed the deal. He told Mike Johnson to veto it. He eventually convinced Mitch McConnell this morning to abandon it. Who? Can you give Donald one name? Give, no, no. Give one name of the Republican who said this is a better Lizzie deal than anything we got with Trump. Give the name. Who is it? What's the name? 
Lindsey Graham. It was a press conference last week. This is what propaganda sounds like, friends. This is the propaganda <laughs> okay. that we learned about when we were children in school. <laughs> this is what propaganda sounds like. a specific like. issue, though. Hold up, guys. Can you, instead of an open, this is propaganda, can you actually specifically address what he said, though? To be fair, he didn't give us the source. Got up by you have a source? By, yeah, well, here's, here's what I want. I want you to post the source of where it came from, where Donald Trump actually said it. Not that some politician said something about something because, you know, politicians are all honest. I want to hear it come out of his mouth. Go ahead. You go. Jack, just to be fair, I think it'd be more, spe ask a more specific question about what are you looking for him to back up? I think that would be helpful. Exactly. Specifically, when Donald Trump told these people, where is the press conference? Where's the conference? Where's the real documentation to it? Not just some politician being a politician. I want to know it. I want to see it. I want to hear it come out of President Trump's mouth. So, Grant, Grant, maybe you know what he's asking. I'm trying to understand what he's asking. And I honestly don't know, but maybe I missed something. So, Grant, I'll let you try to respond to that. I'll try to respond, okay? I mean, you can just look at ABC. Speaker Mike Johnson says he tr speaks with Trump, quote, frequently about border. I mean, this is not rocket science here, guys. Okay, if you think that, that didn't prove your point, that didn't support your point. That if, if you want to, if you want to, uh, you know, you want to know what's going on in politics, let me explain something and what's happening on Capitol Hill. OK, Trump has more support in the House of Representatives from individual representatives than he does overall in the Senate. And in the leadership of the House, he has a lot more support. These are facts that are not really in dispute right now. Okay? But what's the point? The point is that Republicans, Democrats said yes to the Republicans already on what they want for the border. And they refused to take yes for an answer because they want Grant. that issue. They want that issue, and that's just a fact. I, but but the Grant, who cares not, yeah, what the Senate, who cares what Senate Republicans or, or even yes. Republican or, congressmen? I don't care. I'm asking about Donald Trump versus Joe Biden in particular here. Okay. Who do you believe is going to be stronger on the border? I mean, it's a rhetorical question because uh, I, I know what your I answer is going you. to be. I, I, but when you're, saying, when you're saying that it's not a Biden policy, that this is not a Biden policy issue when it comes to him Threatening Greg, Governor Greg Abbott and wanting to force the border open. And, you know, wh wh why are we seeing that? Why is he why does he want to cut the razor wire? Why does he want to take down barriers? Why isn't he going to allow Texas to defend itself? So, Nick, I think that was a fair question. This is a fair but question. But let, like, uh, I think it's a really fair question. And, um, like, I so, think the question was to Grant, like, who would do a better job on border security, Biden or Trump? I think it's a fair question. And Senate Republicans have already said Biden. I don't do a better care, job. Grant. I don't care about that. Well, you know, Biden you had three. want to elect Trump if his own people and his own party are saying it. If the people that are in power that have the votes that are in Washington, who know the best in your party, the Republican Party, are saying Biden's going to do it better. We'll get more with Biden. I think what? that you really have to consider <laughs> yeah, Grant. I, you know, why, are, why is I mean, your I, candidate I, I, hey, listen, allowing people work. to come over to this? Why is your party candidate party. not doing something about it? He has the he's power. He's trying, but Republican How? Issue. How? Is he, he's that, you, no, you no, wait a second. So he can tireless. go, wait. He, here, okay. I, 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 here, let's break this down. Let's break this down. So he can send. No, here, I, I heard you already. So listen, here's he what happened. So he sends the feds down to Texas to remove stuff repeatedly. Now he's threatening. He says he's going to remove the razor wire and everything. If he was going to stop it, why would he force Texas out of the way to allow people to keep coming through? That's the, the question. question. Why? I'll answer it. Marco Rubio made a statement about the wire, right? And the reason why they want to remove the wire is because people are dying, right? And, you know, our government what? actually has... Yeah, you, you try it with wire. somebody else, buddy. Try it with... No, no. You you're, have, you're, listen, do you want to... Full of shit. Do you want to see it? Look, you want to be like, hey, you're full of shit? Go somewhere else. Debate a brick wall, okay? It'll say you're don't, right don't every read, time, Jack. but you're wrong. No, now I'm right here speak. and you have to face me. Let me speak or I don't need to be here, okay? You brought up a point. Now it's my turn. Look, Marco Rubio is saying we should do what you guys are talking about. Keep some, this razor wire up. People are dying because of what the state of Texas is doing. People Who is dying, Grant? Dying. Refugees trying Fire. to seek asylum by 
Why, why are Dude, they're they're right. you know here to begin with? You know. Grant, refugees, not, refugees are people that are leaving war. Why? Uh, which war are they uh, escaping? You know, that's not true. Okay. Oh, yeah, it is. That's the people it's who are leaving war it is, is one it category. It is true. It's absolutely It is not the only category. Thank you. So, you just had refugees. No. Well, hold on a second. You can't just call them asylees just because they're trying to get into the country. That's the oldest trick that Democrats they have been trying to use in the last decade. If you're an asylee, you must come through a board of entry. A okay. board of entry. Well, don't you feel like hell all you want is to pretend that's not the law. But the law is if you want to be, if you want to claim status as an asylee, you must come through a port of entry. And okay. you also must that's stop at the first country that, they, that offers you safe harbor. Fewer that's, than, right. that's right. Yeah. So, so when you call them asylees, that's just, that's an intentional mislabeling and, in order to try and 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 earn them some sort of emotional status, which they we don't demerit, so that you can try you can create some sort of ju this, justification. You know what? Or emotional status. They're done. This about the law. I have a legal question for you. Where in the law does it state that the penalty for these actions is death on the spot without a trial? Who is no, killing no. people? That is a lie. Okay, that is a okay. verified no, lie. lie. Why are you pushing this? Listen. Wait, you... Okay, so wait a second here. That's your... Sorry, I lost some signal, guys. I'm sorry if I'm fading back in and out. So Joe Biden has the power to leave what's up at place, and then people will stop coming. You say people are dying. Well, people have already died before. I mean, if you go to the border, the border patrol, they spoke extensively on this, on how they've been dealing with this for years. But now with this wave, Joe Biden has the opportunity and the resources to send these people back. And yet okay. he's not doing it. So you're well, in a, a dead, it's a dead me. argument well, can, can for I, you. I it's a just question. a dead argument. Just Another legal question. Can I ask? Uh, Grant, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to go ahead. Ask a question. Well, Grant, before so, you do uh, that, I, I would like to request in the meantime that you can uh, show some sort of evidence that people are dying at the hands of Texas because they're securing the border. Please. Got it. Read the news? There were three. A mother and her two children died in the Rio Grande because they were caught in the barbed wire and the Texas officials didn't let the Fed go and rescue them. Will you? Oh, that's a lie. That's, that's a lie. That's a lie, that's lie that's Brian. Brian. That's, that's it. That's, that is an absolute lie. Texas wasn't even aware people were that they even existed until 30 minutes later when the well, Mexican let the they're aware they're aware now. People give the feds access that's the problem look well, Nick, they're aware they 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 you, are. Huh? you care about the life of that woman and her two children you're such a good christian you know what i got a question <laughs> it's a simple one it's a simple one it's for our lawyer friend you know it says dude follow the laws of the land so don't use that yeah, don't talk right. about you someone you know, know nothing so about them. so listen nobody is question. saying to let them drown but that doesn't mean that that they're alive it's just let them drown i'll say it let them drown Okay, so people in, invade us you're telling me that there are three people that there are three people who decide to they're pretend that they're asylees or not even pretend that but the democrats want to label them as we have no reason to believe they're asylees at least that's fair but they're still coming here for work they're not invading all right no okay i'm gonna meet the panel real quick because we need to kind of limit the amount of people talking over each other here brian Give Coming for second. work is not a good reason to seek asylum in the United States. You, you, you. You're right. It's an abuse, but there's still people that are coming because they're desperate and they shouldn't be dying and getting treated like, like animals with the barbed wire and all How is that all all fault? All right. Hold up a second, Brian, guys. If, if, if you give him a little, if you give him a little, I'm not saying I agree one way or the other on this, it's, but if you give him a little bit of a space to explain that, it might be helpful. But I think that we should debate this issue, but I wanted him to complete that thought. Okay, which thought specifically? The, the, you, the, the assertion, hold up, Jack, the assertion from Grant and Brian is that people are dying, and the implication is that they are dying because the United States is doing something to, if the implication is the United States is doing something to kill them, that, that shows the malice and intent. It's hey, guys, I'm trying, this is the problem. I'm trying to get a, I'm trying to get a dialogue going with Brian here, but I can't do that. Yeah, but so frame if you're it with the actual facts. Don't frame it with, well, there's a bunch of suppositions. No. Yeah, the implication, though, Grant, the state of Texas facilitated that. engaging in extreme policies that are causing harm to some migrants who are dying as a result of the extreme policies like barbed wire and those and people being detained out in the open for long periods of time and being bussed away by Greg Abbott. There was a woman who killed herself who needed mental problems because she was bussed to New York City. 
She had severe problems, didn't know what was going on. She committed suicide in one of the shelters. This cruel man is sending these people with no warning to cities so they don't even have time to prepare. If he was actually a decent human being and a Christian like he claims, he would actually tell the states of New York or wherever, hey, I'm sending you these people, get ready. But he's doing it out of spite to teach the sanctuary cities a lesson. Trumpism and and their fascist movement is all about hate, spite. The cruelty is the point. And that's why he's so popular. They love this barbed wire thing. Texas doesn't have the authority. It's the United States government that controls the border. Texas does not control the national border with Mexico. They're infringing their constitutional role. They don't have that role and they're violating the constitution and the Biden administration has every right to regulate how they're going to enforce the border. And we don't need razor wire in the Rio Grande. Ryan, I, I do want to say, I want to okay, respond okay, right. so to one point. What, what, what do you suggest? Here? I want to respond to one of Brian, Brian's point. Brian, Brian, you said that Abbott is shipping all these people up to the sanctuary cities. Now, there's a small amount of people, the small amount of people that have been bussed by Abbott is not the, the major amount of people who are, let's say, in New York. Out of less than like the 120 or 130,000 people that are there, so like 60 or 70 percent went there on their own. The same is with Chicago. And a lot of those people who have been shipped up there are actually coming from a, the democratic city of El Paso in Texas, who is coordinating with New York and Chicago. So I, I just want just so we uh, just we just want to keep down, it just so we the facts. I'm going to remove you if you keep talking over just, people. Just so we can get the facts. New York even admits that. That's why they. That's why New York and Chicago sent contingencies down to the border to tell people to stop coming to New York, even without the whole bus thing. And that's because New York and Chicago said they were sanctuary cities, and the New York has the right to shelter law, where if you make it to New York, they have to put you up. So you know this. Even though I understand the political thing is I've been sending everybody, but that's just not true. It's a small, maj- the small majority, a small, not even majority, a small amount of people are being shipped by Abbott, but the majority of people who are up there are going up there on their own. I don't disagree. I didn't say that Abbott was super responsible for all of it, but to the degree that he's responsible for shipping any of those people without warning, that is cruelty. It's inhumane. So- Brian, allow me to ask a question on that. I think he did give the other cities opportunity and notice that he'd be sending people to their states. I'm not going to argue that it's a great policy decision or a bad policy decision. But at this point, they're well aware that Texas will be shipping migrants across the country. They've been, and like I said, Abbott did put them on notice initially anyway. So I think, I don't know who it was, but someone did ask a fair question, which is, What's the alternative? Is Texas just supposed to absorb this themselves? Should they stop sending? I, you know, I really do think that's a fair question. What's the alternative? Well, if the fair question is talk to states and coordinate and ask permission. Like it's a violation for Texas to be taking people and just shipping them to cities they don't like. There are plenty of cities in other states that might even be willing and need workers or something. I don't know, but there's no coordination where Abbott is literally calling his counterpart in another state and saying, why don't we coordinate on this and let's make sure these people are taken care of. No, he just puts them on the bus and sends them north and, and they get and they are not told ahead of time when and where they're arriving. They did that as a stunt. They sent it was either Florida Good. or Santa's. I would do the same thing, Brian. They sent them to D.C. to, to Kamala Harris's residence, the, the VP's official house. This is a political sentence out of spite. Those people were standing around. They didn't know where to where they were supposed to go, what they were supposed to do. People didn't know to meet them there. This is cruelty. Greg Abbott, I'm sorry. He is a disgusting, inhumane piece of shit. Okay, I would okay, do so the, the same thing, Brian. You know, just, in just to be clear, Brian, I, I want to be clear on your opinion here. You think that the Texas government should have to absorb all of these people. No, I'm saying they so should they do me. absorb they the majority of them. Of them. You should coordinate with Texas. Asking, asking but Brian, they don't Texas permission. Who was asking Texas permission for all of these people to come into our state? You're They're telling us borders. we have no. Oh, so we're on the border. So we just become the front door. And then we have to ask and coordinate with all the other states to do anything. And you are, if we have inaction from the federal government, you are saying we can't do anything to address that. And I want to make one final point. This is to Grant earlier. You know, Grant's great border deal that the Republicans got and refused. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Is, is the border security deal that you're talking about, the one where $61 billion goes to Ukraine and additional money goes to other foreign countries and we get $13 billion, is that the good deal that we turned down? Because I think what you'll find is a lot of the resistance to this is the idea that the federal government is funding the borders of other countries to secure those, not ours. 
and they're sticking that together with we don't that's not the way to do this. And so you can't come out here and be like, well, the Republicans, you know, they just really don't want to work together. It's like that's 10 percent of this border bill. No, going listen, to the border. Jason, you're right that 10 percent of the bill was going to the border. But I mean, you're a pro Putin shill. Your tongue is up the asshole of a dictator. You should move to Moscow with your opinion. And that's who you've been talking to. Right? Why is that relevant? Can I respond? I'm, I'm just throwing a typical liberal because response. I'm, because I'm, I'm feeling pretty yours. defamed right, right now. Say, okay. I, I would love for you to go I, ahead. I, I, and sorry, to being, you know, okay. I'm going to mute everybody for a second. I'm happy to co-host with Nick, but I don't, uh, I'm not going to co-host if there's going to be personal attacks. So I want to make that very vividly clear. Okay. Well, you started it. out by person. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we're, we're going to move on from that. We're going to move on from that. Uh, Nicholas, I'm going to, I'm going to, I can, actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to Evie because it's been a while. Hey, thank you so much. So I question, the most important question here is why do we have so many, what is it? 3 million people coming in the country right now, because what I see is what's going to happen by the end, by November 2024. There's no way these people are just coming out of the blue. There is a war in Ukraine, but that's about it. These people are coming here because I believe they are being offered money and opportunity, and that's why they are coming from China and from Africa. And God knows, I don't even know how they came to the border to cross the border because there are foundations that get money to organize them and to bring them in the country. So that nonsense that Grant was saying before that, oh, they're dying and they are escaping and they're desperate. I am a legal immigrant. I have said this before and we came here legally and I'm completely, the border needs to be closed because our economy is getting destroyed. America is getting destroyed. But the, again, the most important question is why do we have so many immigrants coming in the last three years? I have a feeling we haven't seen everything we need to see in this. There's a slight chance they are all going to vote in November 2024, and that's how we're going to lose the, the election. You're suggesting the illegal immigrants crossing the southern border are going to be voting in the election? That's what I think it's going to happen, because what's the reason that all of the sudden we have three million people coming in the last two, three years? This is unusual. These people are being told in, in China, wherever they are, that you have an opportunity to go in America right now and we're going to give you housing, we're going to give you money, and we're going to help you cross the, the, the border, and we're going to put you in premium sitting in Delta and send you to New York City. There's something really evil in here that all of us are, are ignoring. They are not escaping war. So whatever Brian is saying and Grant is saying is the biggest BS ever. But the real issue is why these people are here. We're going to see something really big coming out of this by November 2024. Evie, you're right. In Democrat states, they are trying to get them voting rights, even at the school board level, to try to slide them in. You're 100% right. But not at the federal election level. We can't this is come to the most people. insane conspiracy theory ever. So let's see. The All the propaganda. Is, the conspiracy is Democrats are letting the people in to vote. And so we're shipping them to the blue states so they can vote. I don't get all of this. This is nuts. You should literally self-deport and you could solve the problem yourself. Thank you. Okay, Grant, so you're suggesting that we should let these people infiltrate all of the red cities. They should, you know, they're able to vote and hold office in the red cities. Is that what I'm doing? No, that's her conspiracy theory that they're going to vote. I mean, seriously, like we could, we should actually do like conspiracy bingo or maybe like uh Magic 8-ball or ad -lib. Everything's a conspiracy. Hey, Grant, so what was happening with did, Nader years. and They've Speaker Johnson? What happened? What was the exchange in the committee we just watched where he slipped and said that they were going to try to get them to vote? And then the Speaker Johnson stepped back and said, did everyone hear that? Did you, did you not see that? And is that okay with you, Grant? Is that okay that people who are not citizens can vote in any election within the United States? Is that okay with you? You know what? That's a great question. I live here in Miami and we have a lot of non-citizens who are not allowed to vote in our local elections. And you know what's really sad? Our citizens don't vote in these elections either. We have 15% participation in these elections and they determine the direction of one of America's major cities. So, I mean, the fact of the matter is you have people that are permanent residents. Do you think that a permanent resident shouldn't be allowed to vote for the mayor of their city just because they can't vote for president? Grant, we're not even, to, we're, and, no, they should not. I'm that's, asking. That's the first answer to the question. You just but think, you second, think there are at least a dozen cities that are now allowing undocumented 
illegal immigrants to vote in either some or all of their local election. Okay? Yes, but not the federal yeah. election. So it's not going to affect. So how okay, but affect there's got to be a starting point somewhere. It, it's like with everyone. Uh, like, and then you know, we're ex- no, let's talk about president. congressional seats. President. Let's talk about congressional state seats. Let's talk about le- le- uh, legislative seats. Let's talk they about Senate seats due to population. You know, it's I not mean, just about getting to vote. It's, it's about the so census. Yeah. It's about the agree, census but. and getting. It's about the census and getting more power for those states. The more people they have, that even illegal immigrants count and, toward a census and help grant more power. And, and look uh, at what the, the Republicans are doing by sending the illegal immigrants or undocumented out. They're changing the census against them. Grant, so Grant, just for yeah, a couple yeah, seconds, yeah, I'm exactly. going to let you be in Beijing because Joe Biden won't do it. Grant, Grant, Grant I want you to finish Grant. the... It's not about politics. Go ahead. Grant, you to finish the thought and then we're in a good hands. So look, I mean, go to places in the South where they're deeply anti-immigrant and you know what you'll find? It's very difficult to do anything, okay? There's not a lot of labor. People that were on the edges of the labor market are, are not there, Okay. People that live here don't want these jobs. I mean, I have a friend that does a lot of uh, work in Boone, North Carolina, for example, and it's impossible to find bus drivers, for example. I mean, this is affecting our economy. It's not good for our economy. I think that we should all think about what Elon Musk said, which is that illegal immigration is bad. We need to make the legal process better. And in 2013, Marco Rubio put together a bill and got the Senate to pass it to change the immigration process for the better. And I think that we need to reform the immigration process, period, to avoid all the border problems. Okay, okay Appreciate so that. why don't we go to holding real quick? Of Americans. What, Got it. Why don't, we, why don't we go to Before holding do, real quick? What are your thoughts? I, I want to go to, I want to go to Javon first because he's been the most patient one on the panel so far. And then we, and then we can jump to holding. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, thanks, Nick, Mario, and Justin. Pleasure to meet you. I don't think you were in the space last time. Jack, good to see you. I've kind of been listening in to Grant and Brian. And let me just say a couple of things. Starting off, number one, I find it to be fascinating that all of a sudden the Democrats are for executive action on the border because for four years during the Trump administration, you all were the ones telling us that what he was doing was illegal and unconstitutional. That's number one. That's the first thing I find to be fascinating. Congressional uh, action. Congressional n- action. Num- with number the two. Number two. You know, because what Biden is doing isn't congressional action. No, right? the, the, the bill that they want to pass was. Right, right. But, but let's, watch the back and, well, let's watch the back and forth, guys. Javon, go ahead and finish your point. Yeah. So, so what I was, again, what I'm referring to is President Trump securing the border in, uh, in his first term and Democrats saying what he was doing was unconstitutional and an abuse of executive power, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Number two, another thing I find fascinating is people like Grant and like Brian took talking points to say things like voter ID is anti-black. And I'm going to tell you as the only black person on the stage, you're wrong. And you need to stop demeaning people who look like me to say things like we're too, to suggest things, excuse me, that we're too dumb to vote. I have never met a black American in the United States in the history of my 26 years on this planet that does not have an ID. So y'all can drop that nonsense. The reason y'all are pushing for non-voter ID laws is because people who are not American citizens rarely have voter anything to certify that they are a citizen, such as a driver's license or et cetera. And let's be honest here, people. In the city of New York, there was a bill that was passed. It was God, thank God, overturned by the judicial, by, by the judges in New York City to that bill was essentially trying to get it so non-Americans could vote in citywide elections. I don't know if you know this, but New York is the largest city by population in the United States. So if you don't think they're going to try to escalate that, it's absurd to me. And to sit here and say, well, it's local elections, it's state elections, it's not the federal government. You guys do not understand the Constitution as written. We are a federal republic. The power lies in states, not the federal government. So, yes, I'm sorry to tell you, but that's an abuse of the Constitution. And lastly, this blows my mind because it's never talked about. Y'all will sit there and say, well, these people are refugees and they're coming here for a better life. What the hell is the Mexican government doing? Okay, you guys will sit there and demean our Border Patrol agents out the wahoo. But when it comes to the Mexican government, who is allowing them to come here because they don't like Biden and they don't like President Trump and they don't like the U.S., y'all seemingly have nothing to say about that. The reason why immigration, why we didn't have six million immigrants in three years in the Trump administration is because we negotiated with the Mexican government to establish things like refugee centers in their home countries. And we had the migrant protection protocols, which said you had to seek refuge in neighboring countries before you brought your ass to our southern border. 
That's why immigration was down. And for y'all to sit here and, 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 and try to suggest that what Texas is doing is inhumane, yet what Mexico is doing by allowing them to cross rivers and deserts is somehow just a, a non-talking point is absurd to me. I think your anger is misdirected. Stop demeaning your fellow Americans and let's start actually uniting and focusing on the fact that these South American countries are sending people to their deaths a lot of the time. And guess who's profiting from it? The cartels. So that's all I had to say. I, I think you guys don't, I don't know if you guys don't understand the government, but you guys like big government when it works for you. And then you guys don't like big government when the other side does the same thing. I think you need to make up your mind. You're talking about Rubio's 2013 immigration plan. That's long gone. What we're dealing with now is akin to an evasion. When you have 26,000 Chinese nationals crossing our southern border while there's a Pacific Ocean between us, I, I think that's something to be said. And it's not, people are not going to realize it until something egregious happens, and then you'll want to do something. All right? So let, let's stop the BS here and stop pretending like Republicans are immoral or, or these satanic people because we care about our fellow citizens who live close to the border. I think that I think you guys are making the wrong argument. And frankly, this is why I think you guys are going to lose black and Hispanic voters by historic proportions come 2024, because you keep talking to us like we don't understand policy, like we're stupid, Grant and Brian. And you already made your point. So You're just repeating yourself uh, over and over again. And he made me. So can I please respond? He made his point. Quick I, hey, Brian, I, absolutely. And quick response. And then we're going to get a hands back to hold. Uh, okay. I, I, I here's the thing. You're blind. To, You're blind. So here's the thing. You don't get is that actually people like Grant and I do understand that there are huge problems with the Mexican government's policies, with the government's of Central America and their inability to deal with these gangs after we, by the way, destabilized them during the Cold War. That's a big part of the reason Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador are having a lot of these problems. But again, there's no slippery slope to giving, if some cities or states want to give immigrants the right to vote in their elections, there's no slippery slope to federal elections because that's regulated by the U.S. Constitution. And it takes years. You know how long it takes people to get citizenship. They're not going to be citizens in a year, two or three or four years. They will not be able to participate. None of the will be able. I'm still going there because you went way longer. None of these people are going to be participating in the 24 election. What you're doing is fascist fear mongering, trying to say, oh, the brown people that aren't there are uh, no, you're not going to pull the racial right? argument right now. Well, but there are people of all races that can be anti-immigrant against people that are of Latin American. Anti-immigrant and racist okay? are two it different is, things. It, it, Correct? No, it's, it's about the southern border because no one talks about the northern border. No one talks about Irish immigrants. Because there's not six million people in three yeah. years. Yeah, but it's, it's the brown people at the southern border. Bro, that I'm immigrant. brown. What are you talking yeah, about? You're not, you're not showing any compassion for the brown people about. dying because of cruel policies from Texas. And yes, the cartels are awful. Yes, and oh, I don't think we are left. Amlo yeah. is a gas These leader. People Mexican, say black okay? people can't be racist, yet they will call a black conservative racist because I said I want to secure the border. Anybody you can are, be racist. I'm unfortunately, so anybody can. It's a, it's a sad truth. And I, Nick, I, I, I beg you. I beg you to stop, Brian. This has been the Brian show. I'm tired. Jeez. Well, Sarah, you know, Brian, wait, you, you make me sound like Brian, I'm some You have a weird thing, thing where you think my immigrant is, is related to race, and it's not. All right, right? guys. All right, it's guys. Not. Let's wrap it up briefly so we can go back to hands, as I promised. I don't want to be up here seconds. promising things, and I, I don't want to be up here promising things and then not be able to fulfill them. So let's Let me wrap it up in 30, 30 seconds, seconds, and then we're going to go to Holden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look, I, I never said that you were a Satanist or immoral. That's something you said about yourself, and I, I don't think you should say that either. Secondly, you know, voter ID is, it should be standardized and Democrats have a bill for that. It's called the Freedom to Vote Act. It's part of the John Lewis right, Voting Rights Act. And I think that needs to be passed. And I just want to give one example. My, my related grandmother, you know, she's from New York. She's been gone for 20 years now. But if she was alive today, she would have trouble proving that she was born in America because the records house that stored all the birth certificates in New York burned down at a certain point. It's not as cut and dried as it seems. And I think that we need a national standard for voter ID. And Democrats hey. want to elect past that, okay? Hey, you know, I said 30 seconds. That was pretty close. It was like 10 seconds over, but that's pretty darn good. In radio, we had to like internalize that stuff, but that's darn impressive, Grant. I All right, yours on the video too. Did you really? That's awesome. All right, yeah. Holden, you're up. Hey, thank you, my friend. Justin, appreciate you, Mario. And I think, you know, it... The with this debate, there there needs to be serious immigration reform. Like you know, Grant, like you're saying, I agree with you. But at the same time, there's a crisis happening right now. You know, we can't wait for the reform 
to happen when there's a crisis at the border right now. And the debate, you know, over calling it an invasion or whether it's in, inhumane, you know, the open border we have right now is not humane. There's not only a crisis of our national security at the border, but there's a humanitarian crisis. You know, it's not, and it's also not fair to the people who've agreed to, immigrated here legally or are trying to migrate here legally. You know, their migrants are being extorted and sex trafficked by the cartels to get to the border. This is not humanitarian, the policy we have right now. And then here in the U.S., we're having public spaces overrun by migrants because there's nowhere to house them. And I mean, cities like New York City is being forced to cut its social services spending because of the migrant crisis. So this is not humanitarian for anybody involved. And, you know, as many people up here have said, you can't have a nation without borders. I'm, you know, I'm a Kennedy supporter. I like what he says about this issue that we need, you know, tall walls. We need a serious board, a serious border security. And we need wide gates. You know, we need to be open to legal immigration. But what we have right now is not sustainable and it's not humanitarian. And to touch, you know, on the broader election debate as well, virtually nothing about this election is not unprecedented. You know, there, I think there's a real potential for a black swan event here with uh, RFK Jr. He's already polling, you know, 20, 25 percent of the electorate. And, you know, it's the biggest difference, obviously, is that you've never had an alternative candidate with the, the f most famous last name in American politics. And I can speak, you know, I'm 22. I can speak from the Gen Z perspective a bit is that we do not feel like our votes matter. You know, we've seen very little actually change from administration to administration throughout our lives. You know, we can't cannot get housing. Housing is unattainable. We've been at war our entire lives. Like there's thing, there's big things like that. You know, it seems like the past few administrations we have are more making change, you know, on the cultural issues. They're not really fundamentally trying to root out the corruption that's in our system right now. And so I think there's a real chance for a black swan event this year, partially because, you know, Gen Z, who does not feel like our votes have mattered in the past, I think is going to be more inspired to come out to vote if there's a candidate saying, you know, I am going to uproot the system and has spent 40 years as an environmental lawyer, you know, going after these corporations, cleaning up the Hudson River. He's been doing that for decades. And I think that's going to resonate with people. And then, you know, earlier someone was mentioning uh, Joe Manchin as well, like no labels could get into this. And if you have a scenario like that, then there's three or even four major candidates. The vote is going to be split, you know, a lot more than we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Like in the 1860 elections, like 150 years ago. So it's a, maybe not the best precedent, but in the 1860 election, there were four major candidates. The, the two major parties at the time both split in half, and Abraham Lincoln won the 1860 election with just 39% of the vote. So I think we're in a similar situation today because, like I said, you know, virtually nothing about this election is not unprecedented. Everything's unprecedented. And if there's four candidates on the ballot, you know, I think you're going to see a major split and the potential for a black swan. That was very well spoken for a young man. I got to be honest with you. That was very well spoken. I would love to speak with you offline and share some thoughts from a Gen X, if you wouldn't hey, mind. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just gave you a follow. I'd love to connect. Yeah, let's do it. I'd like to really get the pulse. on. I have two kids that are Gen Z, but, you know, where your thinking's at. You, you spoke very well, though. I will say that. So Nick, real quick, uh, shout out to you. I don't have the ability to bring anybody up or put anybody down. It's bugging out. So I will say to people, at least the way I run, say I'm an old school radio guy, but at least the way I run it, I like to try to include as many voices as possible. So if you're on stage presently and uh, you think maybe you've spent your time and want to allow someone else to get up, go ahead and voluntarily drop down. But if no one voluntarily drops down and Nick wants to bring other people up, I'll leave that to him. Yeah, I yeah, don't have yeah, a problem sort of going down. Just a little bit here. Yeah, Nick, I don't have a problem going down. I think I messaged you. I don't know if you saw the message about Gino. He would bring a lot to the conversation because he's on the south side of Chicago. He ran in the first district of Chicago, and he has a lot to say about the immigrant overtaking immigrants, overtaking the black community on the south side of Chicago. Yeah, I brought him up. We'll give him a shot. But Kevin, in the meantime, I want you to jump in here. What's up, guys? Awesome space, as always. And I appreciate people coming in who, you know, it's... I just think it's so funny that they talk about jobs that Americans won't do. Jobs that Americans won't. I mean, how racist is that? That there are jobs in America 
that, oh, white people, we shouldn't have to do those. We'll just import poor people from all over the world so that they can be the chief waiters and bus boys in restaurants so that they can clean our hotels. Maybe some of these companies in an open market, maybe they should pay a hey, little. I think your mic is a little rough, man. Is there any way you can try to adjust? You know, I'll let you continue. All right, you got me now? Much better. There we go. go. There you go. Right. Headphones suck. I just think it's ridiculous that, you know, maybe these companies that are looking for workers should pay a little bit more instead of relying on the poor people from around the world to do the jobs, that, quote, Americans won't do. Maybe Democrats shouldn't have paid people to stay home for the last three years and force people back into the workforce so that we wouldn't need those sorts of jobs to be filled by the poor people all over the world. And another thing, even if we wanted to, make it some sort of merit-based system where we bring in all the mechanical engineers from around the world. Maybe the poor countries around the world need their nurses, need their doctors. I mean, somebody brought up the fact that we overthrew Nicaragua 50 years ago. All right, yeah, we did. And we shouldn't have done that. But you know what? Maybe 50 years is enough time to get your act together that we don't have to import all of your 22-year-old men. I mean, the argument that this is just 